Greetings, my beloved Black people. Welcome back to the plight and struggle of Black people in America. As you know, we always have special guests, very special guests, and we won't be changing that. And the brother that's the guest today, I've been knowing him for several years, and <clears throat> wow. One thing about it, when you Black and love Black people, you love when you know someone else that love black people too. And without further delay, we'll bring our guest. Brother James, how you feeling, man? I'm well, I'm well. <laughs> greetings, greetings, everyone. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, introduce myself. I am, uh, yes, Brother James Rogers is what I go by, James Rogers the third, And uh, just happy to be here, man. I appreciate the opportunity Absolutely. to talk about my uh, favorite subject. You know, yeah. Well, yeah. but before you get to all that, what about your personal situation? Were you born and raised, stuff like that, high school, all that good stuff? Okay, okay. I'm I'm I'm, I'm a native of Dallas, Texas. Uh, born in uh, 1954, so y'all know how old I am now. <laughs> okay, sure do. What and month? May 22nd, 1954. Okay. And I'm a uh, 1972 graduate of Lincoln High School. In sunny South Dallas. In sunny South Dallas. So yeah, I mean, that's what's we, up. we just celebrated our 50th uh, anniversary of being out of high school. So, wow, that's a blessing. Yeah, it is. It is. It's mm -hmm. tough. Now, as you said, you do, you know me from a, uh, the U.S. Postal Service. I'm a, a retiree of the U.S. Postal Service. Congratulations! Oh man, I'm, <laughs> I'm loving it, man. It's nothing like staying at home and getting paid. You, you know? heard me. <laughs> <laughs> And I feel you too. <laughs> yes, sir. I, I, I can't believe it's true sometimes, you know. Oh, yeah. Pinch yeah. yourself. Yeah, get paid, get paid and stay at home. Well, guess what, though, brother? Obviously, you earned it. You wouldn't have got it otherwise. 44 <laughs> years. 44 years. You earned it. You earned it. I did 32 over there. Ooh. Yeah, the criteria was 30, so I went two more than I had to. So, yeah. <laughs> Come and join this life, I tell you. You know, even some millionaires have to go to work. Yes, yes, that's true. And I don't know if I was a millionaire, would I go to work? I, everybody say they would. You know? Well, see, I think it depends on your situation of your business. I think most millionaires go to work at certain businesses due to the fact, sadly, <clears throat> some of these companies, if someone's not there watching, observing, and monitoring, there will be some uh, thievery going on. Okay? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. So yeah. some millionaires have to go to work to make sure the people there don't rob them. <laughs> yes, and true. he won't be wealthy anymore. Yes, That's so a part true. of it. But life is good if you want it to be. I say, that's so true. So <laughs> make true. it be what you want it to be is what I believe in. For me, fortunately, uh, to make me happy is to be in a position to at least try to help somebody else, and that's what I love doing. Oh, that's a, that's a great trait, man. That's a great trait to have to help be helping someone else in any way you can. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So. I appreciate you, brother. Oh, yeah. Well, you go on with you talk about in Cobra. What's that on your shirt? That's actually uh, the name of our organization, one of our T-shirts. Okay, the, okay. Reparations. Reparations. Yeah, that's one of our T-shirts. And, of course, our, our a nice flag, one, too. Our flag. Oh, I have a I have a, a, a You mean like, for, okay, I thought you were talking about you have them available. I was like, for sale, because I want to buy one. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I have a collection of T-shirts, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, most of them I got by attending uh, our annual conferences. We always give out a T-shirt at our annual conference, and so is that held in different uh, cities. Always. Okay. Always, okay. Always. Yeah, that's what's up. Y'all still can... have those? Yes, and we have one planned for June, which will be uh, um, June the. The weekend after Juneteenth. I'm not sure what, what day it is right now. I don't have the flyer. However, it will be in the Bay Area. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. In, in California. And mm -hmm. I haven't had one there in quite some time. We we are a national organization, and we have chapters and members from coast to coast. How old is the organization? Uh, and, Co and COBRA is 36 years old. It was okay. created in 1987. Uh, and uh, it was created for the sole purpose of winning reparations. Hmm. And so when we started in 1987, our 
say the purpose and the mission is the same, but our our main goal at that point in time was uh, making reparations a, a household word. You know, so uh, what was the founding city? The founding city or our headquarters city is Washington, D.C. Okay. So yeah, it's, our headquarters okay. is still Washington, D.C. That's what's up. And uh, that's where, where it was founded by. That's where those black people built all of those buildings at, right? The, uh, White House deal and that big tall deal in the middle. Black man was that Benjamin Banneker designed that whole he, area. He did, yeah, he designed that city. They, that's why sometimes we call it Banneker City and not. Okay, Washington. I know that's right. Yeah, yeah that brother yeah. did that. Yeah, a lot of the blacks <laughs> there call it Banneker City, but yes, I didn't know that. Did. That's good info. I never heard that before. Banneker City. That's yeah, that's info. what we call them. Yeah, in fact, you know, most of the cities that had prominent African uh, people or leaders, we, we just renamed the city. Just okay. like uh, Jackson, we call that Megar Eversville. You know? That's what's up. I never heard that before, but it reminded me when I was young, elementary or something like that. Uh, I'm from Philadelphia, and I went to a high school called Benjamin Franklin, all male. And when I was in elementary school, it was around the time when uh, Malcolm X was murdered, and those brothers changed Benjamin Franklin to Malcolm X. But it only lasted while they were there. And then they came back, had to have some shirts and everything. And they did what you're talking about with those areas. But I never heard of those areas before. But I'm sure it's a lot more. And that's great information. I love so many aspects of our blackness, you know, our black culture and our black everything. Because uh, whatever we run into, we're going to sauce it up a little bit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If it's a game or a sport, we run it out and we get in it. <laughs> Come on, yeah. we're going to do something different with it. That's us. So you know true. What I'm so yeah, true. that is us. We, we those people. <laughs> yeah, we those kind of people. You're right. So, yeah, we we uh, we started in 1987. And our, uh, like I said, our first goal was to make reparations a household word. If That's you believe it or not, a lot of people, as we, you and I was talking about, didn't didn't know what reparations was. You know? Right, right. I remember the first time I heard the word, I was like, what is that? <laughs> and so did I, and so did I, and so did I. So I was introduced to this organization in 1995 at mm. the Million Man March. Okay, yeah, yeah I was there yeah. too at the Million so Man March. That was an event, wasn't it? It you was. never forget it. Oh, it that was a day. It was amazing to see the, that many black men, you know, working together, standing together. About two million strong. Yeah. And so the, one of the organizations gave me a flyer. You know, I, they get, everybody was giving me flyers. So I kept them all and brought them all home and went through them. And I saw this one from this in Cobra, uh, you know, a, a membership application for, you know, to join and, and right, right. fight for reparations. And I took it to work and showed it to one of my friends, our co-workers. And I was actually laughing. I said, these people actually think that this government <laughs> is going to pay reparations? <laughs> and so uh, I guess you know about the Third Eye. There was a group here in Dallas. Yeah, yeah, I remember. They used to be over there on uh, Martin Luther King Boulevard with the events. That's right. Great so, speakers they brought in. So many yeah, great speakers. That's, that's what I was getting to. I was. I went to one of their conferences, and I went to sit down in a chair, and then there was an in Cobra flyer there. I was like, what? <laughs> they here, they here in Dallas. You know? Okay, okay. And so I took it back to my coworker and said, "Look, I've seen they in Dallas too." You know, I said, "I found it at the Third Eye Conference." She said, "Looks like the creator trying to tell you something. You might have right, to go right, to that right. meeting. Go to that meeting and see what they, you know, because you don't got two flyers from them." And do so, you, by any chance, remember who you were going to the Third Eye to see that day? Ooh, no, no. Okay, I thought you might not, but I was just curious, <laughs> just in case you did. I've yeah. been to so many of them. I'm okay. sure. I'm sure they have brought so many great people here. Twice a year, they that's been something here. Dallas have done a lot of, and I appreciate it. Even that sister over there that had the books over there, uh, you know, in Winwood Shopping Center, she even brought a lot of people in. I even took a, a photo with Chuck D because when she would bring them in, you could take photos with them and stuff too. Oh yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. And then yeah. over there, community uh, leadership lunch and John Wiley and those brothers used to bring in speakers over there on Tuesday. Uh, lunch at least at lunch and dallas have done a lot of that and that has helped us that care <laughs> you know what i'm saying yes oh yeah yes so i i went to that meeting and i was you know i'm thinking it's some kind of radical group like the panthers or something you know so i want they're ready to you know okay join the okay. struggle 
and I saw all these intellectuals, <laughs> you know, okay. actually, yeah, the guy who, who was over it, the chairman, he was a, a, an attorney, you know. Is that the light skin brother with dreads? Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. he went to Mississippi, didn't he? I forget his yeah. name. You remember his name? Uh, M. Hotep Akibalan. I used to see him at the luncheon, too. He used to be there, too. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. Oh, that's what's up, yeah. man. Black is beautiful, man. Oh, man, I, le I learned yeah. so much from him. Uh, oh, yeah, he's a great dude. So he had started this Dallas chapter of Cobra, and uh, he brought in, uh, you know, like you said, some speakers and stuff. Yeah. And we had town hall meetings, and uh, he brought in Chuckway Lumumba. I don't know if you know Chuckway. Uh, not offhand. I like that name, Lumumba, for sure, though. Yeah, Chuckway, <laughs> he, he was one of the greatest attorneys that you've ever met. What city did he come from, you know? Uh, he was actually born in Detroit, but okay. he moved. He, he moved to uh, Jackson, Mississippi. That's where okay. his office was. That's what's up. Yeah, he moved to Jackson, Mississippi, because he was a part of the uh, Republic of New Africa. Okay. Uh, and I, I hope you've heard of them. Because I'm was that with Kwame and Kume? You talking about? No. Or, or was that uh, uh, brother Stokely Carmichael's thing? No. Okay. No. Uh, Republic of New Africa was started by uh, Dr. Imari Obadeli and his brother. And, and actually, they were from Philadelphia. Okay. Uh, and they they uh, started it in Detroit. And and then they moved uh, their, their headquarters to uh, Jackson, Mississippi. The Re Republic of New Africa is a uh, 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 provisional government, whereas uh, some Africans in 1968, I think that's when they started it, decided that, you know, all they wanted from this country was to be, you know, be left alone, to be allowed right. to govern themselves. Right, right. And so they, they signed the Constitution and, and created a, a whole new government for themselves. Mm -hmm. right. and, they, and they moved their headquarters to Jackson, Mississippi. They have their uh, Black Legionnaires, their own military force or whatever you want to call it. And uh, it's still going on today. Actually, I'm a member of the Republic of New Africa also. Okay. Yeah. So do yeah. they have like a website and stuff like that? Maybe? Definitely. Just look, Okay. Just, yeah, RNA, Republic of New Africa. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And they saying. have their own president. They have their own elections. I'm actually on the election commission uh, for the Republic of New Africa. We'll be That's having elections. Yeah, we'll be and, having elections. And this elections. keeps hitting my mind, so I guess I'm going to have to Put it out there, and I hope it's for good source. Anyway, it just make me think about you know Texas is the second largest state in the country, right? Yeah, yes. And they have lent more black people than any other state, and I find it quite interesting that Mississippi is the twenty fifth largest state, and it's second only to Texas in lynching black people. That's true. That's true. So Mississippi was well, so the Republic of New Africa actually said they they were going to claim five states they said in the five states that the majority of black people uh live in in mm -hmm. the south right. and they call it their territory their their own nation the report the nation of uh of, of, of new africa right, and right. that those states are uh louisiana mississippi <coughs> alabama georgia and south carolina that's the territory of the republic of new africa mm -hmm. the republic of new africa uh not only was they setting up their own government, they petitioned the United States government for reparations. Yeah, and they was they was a, 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 a how you say it a, a, a high French. A, I don't say radical. I don't want to say radical, but they were under yeah. under the watch of the FBI at all time. In fact, the FBI attacked their headquarters at one time. I'm not surprised. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had a shootout with the FBI and the mm -hmm. Jackson police. Right. And uh, I think one of the Jackson police was killed, and, and I think somebody else was injured. And none of the Republican New African pe people were injured, and but they arrested eleven of them, right? And including the president, which was uh, Dr. Mario Bedelli, and gave them all Fed time, federal time. And that happened in Mississippi. Yes, it happened in Jackson, Mississippi. Okay. And, and that attorney I was telling you about, Chuck Way Lamumba, actually right. represented all of them and got them all out of jail. That's what's up. Yeah. I think I'm thinking of Patrice Lamumba when I hear that brother name. That's what it is, because that name yeah, is so yeah. prominent for me. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Lamumba from, uh, from Kenya. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, That's what's up. 
And so the Republic of New Africa also petitioned the government for uh, reparations. And they being such a, uh, I keep wanting to say a, a radical group. They well, let, let me say something about that. Okay, radical, like I look up words in the dictionary. They have a specific meaning, but then they have a connotative meaning that people assume when they hear a word. Mm -hmm. Radical only means one that favors extreme change. And if the situation is dire, you need extreme change. So that's okay. not a bad word. That's okay. just the kind the meaning of it, it seems to be negative, but it doesn't have to be. Most people don't know words. You see? Right, right. This one sister, just off course for a second, I met in Kenya. And I heard, I, I wasn't in Kenya, but she's in Kenya. But she talked about a situation and she said, illiterate people are so dangerous. Man, I thought that was a <laughs> profound statement. Very profound. It's serious too, for real. But anyway, go ahead, brother. <laughs> well, well, basically, what I was saying is a lot of people, a lot of our people did not agree with the concept of our own nation. You know, a lot of us. And so come on, black American citizens. Black Americans didn't agree with the concept of, our, you know, setting up our own nation. And so uh, when I said the Republic of New Africa petitioned the uh, government for reparations, they wanted to expand that 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 movement. And so they created in Cobra. Okay. And, yeah, because in Cobra was not a part of Republican New Africa or the New African, they call it the New African Independent Movement. And so more people will be willing to join in Cobra. You know, the average African right, right, American right. would be willing to join in Cobra. Because they, yeah. you know, we were in things like the NAACP and things like that, you know, people. And I, I learned that, that that's three types of uh, Africans here in America. You have you have one that called themselves Pan-Africans, okay. you know, one group called themselves Pan-Africans that realized that we're Africans, period, no matter where we are. Like Peter Tosh said, if you're a black man, you're an African. You're an African. That's what right, I right. Peter Tosh out of Jamaica said that, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. then you have these uh, so-called uh, uh, black nationalists, like the Republic of New Africa, that, that want their own nation, a separate nation. Inside you know, of a nation. Yeah, yeah, they want to start their own nation right here on this soil, you know. Right, right. And so you have, you know, black nationalists, you know, like you said, people like Stokely Carmichael and the Panthers and people like that were considered black nationalists. Okay, okay. Yeah, and then you have the people that's called uh, 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 people who want to become a part of this nation. Integrationist is the word. People who want to integrate in America and make America a better place. So you have the Pan Africanist, the Black Masculinist, and the Integrationist. And all three of these functions of people are in, in Cobra. You know, we have that. And that okay, and so let me ask you something. Integrationists, so are they caught up in on living with those that are black? What is the deep definition of integration? Because you know, we've heard that, but that seemed to seem to signify those that want to emulate these people but is that what that is i'm trying to get a thorough understanding of, understanding of this integrationist word because well, it seems to have so much to it from my understanding of its history yeah what i what i mean by that is that these the integrationists are people who want to uh be full citizenship full citizens of the united states and have all of the privileges of citizenship People as, as, as like Martin Luther King, who fought against segregation, you know, people of that stratus, we will call an integration somebody who wants to be a full citizen of the United States, not a black nationalist who thought we should have our own nation. OK. Or Pan-Africanists who may want to repatriate back to Africa. Okay. So when I say integrationist, I'm talking about someone who's fighting for a better America for, for our, you know, our, our people. How do you categorize yourself on that? <laughs> <laughs> Although I am in a, a, a black nationalist organization, mm -hmm. I do consider myself a pan-Africanist because I do think that no matter where we are in America, any black person in, in the world are Africans. I and we, we, must, uh, we must ensure that Africa is free. If Africa is not free, we're not free no matter where we are. True. So, you know, in, uh, uh, there's organizations here uh that's a uh, pan-africanist organization uh you would say mark marcus garvey was a pan-african what about that brother uh he's in uh, east st louis that the fbi raided his place not long ago 
80 year old brother. I hadn't heard of him before then, a socialist group, I believe. And he has uh, headquarters also in Tampa, Florida, that they raided at the same time. You familiar with what I'm talking about? Oh, I've, I've worked with him before. His What's name his name? Omali Yesatella. Okay, so what what is his thing? What is out of those three, which one is he? I would consider him a, a, a Pan Africanist. Yeah, I would. And I don't that's know. the one wanting to get back to Africa. Not get back to Africa, but to, to ensure the, uh, the the safety and, and the and the well being of Africa. I hear. You. Yeah. yeah. So being he, allies of Africa's well being. Right. But he is a, he is a socialist by uh, by by uh, for his uh, his political views. Okay. You know, he's mm -hmm. a socialist. Yeah. And yeah, that's again, I've, I've I've worked with him. I've marched with him in D.C. before. Okay, yeah, yeah. Was yeah. he under the guise of the same organization at that time that you marched with him? No, he was in his own organization. Uh, uh, no, I mean the same organization that he got raided with. That's what I'm talking about. Not Joe and Cobra. I'm no, saying no. Okay. He, he's he's associated with Cobra. He spoke at our our. Uh, our conferences before, and he's a a, a, a reparationist. He, he's he's demanding reparations. Also, just, just like a lot. And of this is coming up, and it's interesting, man, because I believe everything happens for a reason to come out. I know we talked not long ago, and you said you were somewhere. I believe it was a conference, and you sat on stage with Minister Louis Farrakhan. I do want to know what city that was, but I want to tell the story part first. And you said that they gathered the funds like they do at some of these events. And Minister Louis Farrakhan said, we're going to give all of that money to Encobra. And I was impressed with that. What city was that in? That was in Detroit. Okay. In, in Detroit. Detroit. And uh, we were there for, uh, I think it was for a conference. Yeah, because we, we actually honored uh, uh Minister Farrakhan, we gave him an award. He, he has done a lot for in Cobra, and okay. it, for as the Nation of Islam has done a lot for in Cobra and the reparations movement. So we gave we honored him, and we honored uh, uh, Judge Mathis, he, who's also okay, in yeah, yeah, out of Detroit, right? Yes, and I didn't know yeah. uh, Judge Mathis was for such an activist. He okay, been, yeah, he is a, a real true activist, and he's been that way all his life if you just know him by his show you wouldn't know that you right, know? right 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 yeah That's he, great brother <laughs> yeah, we, we gave him honors at that that same conference yeah he has his own community center he does a lot of good work in detroit that's great that is great yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's we're gonna do a lot of great things in Dallas, Texas too. <laughs> and we have done a few things. Absolutely, we have done a few absolutely. Things. Back in 1999, I was in, like I said, I was in the Cobra in Dallas at the time, mm -hmm. and we decided to petition the Dallas City Council for a resolution in support of a bill that's pending in Congress, calling on the U.S. government to do a study. To determine what and if reparations are due to Africans in America, so that's one of the things that Encobra does. We go around from city to city and state to state, right, getting right. resolutions and sending them to the U.S. government, saying this city says you need to pass this bill. And yes. so, in 1999, a group of us, uh, with the with the help of uh, uh, Al Lipscomb, got mm -hmm. before, went before the Dallas City Council to right. ask them to pass a resolution. And uh, we actually had to go back again and do it the second time because they didn't make they didn't take a vote the first time. But the second time, the full council was there and uh, 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 the mayor, Ron Kirk, was there mm -hmm. and uh, myself and Sister Diane Ragsdale. And oh, yeah. Yeah. That's few, interesting uh, times. <laughs> yeah. A few others spoke on, on, on behalf of, you know, asking the Dallas City Council to pass this resolution. Mm -hmm. And we was just shocked, man, because they did. They they actually okay. with a thirteen to two vote. Mm, who was the two? Who two that did not vote? Oh, oh, I thought they voted against it. Is what I thought. I didn't think they. No, they, two vo two voted against it. Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. I can't those. remember their name. Okay, that okay. was in 1990. The only reason why I asked is I was curious because I didn't know where you were going with this, but I know during that time. Uh, when Ryan Kirk was running for U.S. Senate of Texas against John Corner, it had came out in the Dallas Weekly that Ryan Kirk 
said he wasn't for reparations. And yeah, uh, yeah and that 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 led us to do something that I, I sometimes I don't know if I should have done it or not. Okay. Um, and we started to protest Ron Kirk at the time because we had just got that resolution passed by the Dallas City Council and Ron Kirk voted in favor of that re resolution that okay. the city of Dallas should send a letter to the U.S. Congress saying that, hey, we need y'all to pass that bill to look at reparation. Mm -hmm. And when Ron Kirk decided to run for U.S. Senate, like you said, a reporter asked him, was he for reparations? And he said he wasn't. Okay. And so to us, that sounded like he had flipped on us, you know. You, you okay. Know, you know, gave a good speech in the council meeting. Then when you get a reporter, you say no. So we actually uh, went on a protest against Ron Kirk. And, and what method? You mean like going to his residence or something? No. Whenever he had a meeting or he was campaigning. Something we like that. We would a show public event. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. public events. We would show up and I, I, yeah. I know the warriors that went to his neighborhood one time to his house. They did the same thing with another white uh, mayor also, Steve Barton, I think his name was. So, you know, that's what the warriors did. And they were around for about six, eight years. I was involved for about four years. And I had a great time, you know, on that bullhorn and even learning about it, how to do it and participate. But yeah. it was a time I suspect all the nineties. I went to any and everything in Dallas that was about black folks that my schedule allowed. I went to. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah, great. That's, that's great. So Warren Kirk didn't obviously didn't win the US Senate. And no, he wasn't about to. It didn't matter what he said. Come on now. It's bigger than what he talking about. That's long money over there. That's just like this Beto dude beating Abbott. Come on now, that ain't gonna happen. Ain't no Latino white guy that's broke. There ain't be no rich white guy. Here, let's <laughs> keep it real. That's all I believe in is real. Come on now, that's a joke. There's no way he gonna be at it with no money. Come yeah. on now. Yeah, that's Capitalist money. society. Come on now. I, I I just think you know we, we may have made it easy for Corning, you know, by protesting Ron Kirk. Like well. It was already easy, player, believe me. I, I guess so. I guess you got a point there, bro. <laughs> it's money, know. man. It's about money. I mean, so, Ryan Kirk, he's living well, but not that well. Yeah, but he actually find wind up getting, you know, when when uh, President uh, Barack Obama got into office. And that's gave, another conversation. Yeah, uh, he gave Ron Kirk. Kirk a position. I think it was. Uh, yeah, but what did he give Blacks collectively? You made me go there. <laughs> 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 that's what I'm talking about. Blacks. I tried to avoid it, but you wouldn't let me. <laughs> no, no, I can't. I can't. You know, I can't think of anything that he did significant for Black. Uh, no, you can't because it don't exist. <laughs> yeah, he may have. He may have a, a tried, but he, he didn't succeed. Well, yeah, yeah, I feel you. But he could have tried harder. How, how about nominating a black woman? He did. Mm. Other women that weren't black. Mm. And yeah, I, in fact, made me think about something. I was actually uh, upset with uh, with Barack Obama because he was he he became president in twenty oh eight, and twenty oh eight the the U.S. Congress passed a resolution. Uh, actually apologizing to African Americans for our enslavement. This is the first time in history that anyone in government had ever admitted that they did us wrong. You know, they, first time they ever admitted that that, that slavery was wrong and they, they shouldn't have done that. And, uh, and then in 2009, the U.S. Senate did the same thing. One year later, they passed a resolution apologizing for our enslavement. But the, the difference was the, the Senate version had on the bottom of it, this could not be used as, you know, as grounds for reparations, you know. Right, right. Yeah, they because, they, you know, and I was so, I was pissed for that reason because they always tell us everything you say can and will be used against you. But you're going you're gonna to apologize and say you were wrong and then say you can't use it against me. Right, right, right. But I was more upset with uh, Obama for not using that opportunity to push for reparations to get you know he could have even passed an executive order to get that bill passed or he could have pushed congress to get that bill passed but he he did not speak up in fact the resolutions were not even they were not bills they were just resolutions so they were not signed by the you know like a bill has to be signed by the president so he stayed completely out of that reparations movement and that wasn't you know that's i, I didn't like, like you're saying 
and but chose not. And that's just one of many blunders I'm gonna call it. <laughs> yeah, he had an opportunity. He had an opportunity to do something that would have been beneficial to all all Africans in America. Yeah, mm, he had that so. opportunity. As those foundational Black Americans, you know what I'm saying? Maybe we're a different group than we are to a degree. Yeah. But, Yes. So that's the mission of Encobra is actually to to win full reparations. And so a lot of people have the concept of reparations being uh, money, getting money, cash check, you know, and that's not what we look at. it. We look at it in a more in a international uh, concept of reparation. Reparations, I think we say it has like five components. And the first component is uh, cessate, since cessation, stop it, non-repetitive, you know, and, and I, I say that by saying, you know, work on or, or do something to eliminate racism, you know, you know, that's, that's one of the, that's, that's one of the big things you get, you got to not, you know, treat us in this fashion anymore. We, we're not going to continue, you know, because, you know, everybody knows that if they just gave you a check, that wouldn't change nothing. Well, I was suspect it needs to be what you're talking about, components, but it needs to be some monetary things involved. That's for oh, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's that's one of those I was going to get to. One okay. is restitution. And restitution means to give back whatever you've taken, you know, whatever you've taken from us, uh, and which was our labor, our labor was taken from us. You have to, you have to, you have to restore the money that you made off of us, you know. Yeah, Restore I mean, that, you know. You I, know. I even wrote Bush on this reparation thing, and it's interesting. I wrote Bush three times, Obama three times, and Trump once. With uh, Bush, I got a response th three times two from him, one from the uh, Department of Justice, <laughs> and then uh, Obama, I got zero responses, and Trump, I got zero responses too. Uh, oh, yeah. But uh, like I say, my last letter to uh, Bush was about reparation, and I had my reparations plan. <laughs> you can look on my thread on Facebook too and find it down there. Okay, yeah, like a two-page deal. Yeah, and, okay. Uh, and most, one, most one of the components was those that are in jail. This was before all this legal marijuana stuff went on. In jail for something like that, and that's all they've done, and no harm to that. They need to be forgiven and let out. That was just one part of it. It's about three parts. And his response was some generic, nothing about the topic. You know how they do. Yeah, yeah, that that is important. When we do stand and we do work with uh, re uh, releasing of political prisoners, we have some people who've been in jail for over twenty years. Or like longer. the brother that put aside Shakur too, and not yes. to mention uh, Geronimo Pratt did twenty five years, and they know that brother was innocent so when they first had the black man lie on him under oath in the stand. Yeah, and, and uh, my man Johnny Coppin worked his case for twenty five years before he got out. Well, come on yeah. now. Yeah, but, political prisoners. That's, in, that's and they important. know they was did that man wrong. The whole government part. And yeah. but there's no nothing just because you give him a few dollars for it. But that ain't nothing. This man, you don't took twenty five years of his life. <laughs> yeah, that's one of those. That's one of those demands that you know we would have in a reparation settlement. You know, and not just you know get right, 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 right. You gotta, you gotta release that. those political prisoners also. You know, that's and and then you got compensation. Those things that they can't return back to you, right, right, right. You know, then they have to compensate you for that. So, you know, the compensation can come in the form of money, and and yes. we say we never take money off the table. But right, right. But it's definitely not the only thing for sure. No, it's not definitely not the only thing. You know, we can you know compensation could be something like uh, uh, an education. Some people want free education. Loan forgiveness, perhaps, right? Student loan forgiveness. Loan forgiveness and uh, just affordable housing. You know, yeah, you yeah. can compensate us in, in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so we say sometimes that that money thing is probably the smallest thing of all that we're demanding is, mm -hmm. is you know, a check. In fact, some some reparationists don't even, you know, you know, don't even go down that road. They don't. Right, even, right. We should be calling for a check. I think in mine, I mentioned something about some money, but it was mainly starting with the older people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That we <laughs> we're entitled to some money. We are. I mean, yeah, because we and still have done that today. You know, the red line and then the outright line to you about what's available or not. Like I read John A. Johnson's book, Succeeding Against the Eyes. You know, that's the brother that invented Ebony and Jet magazine. 
when this brother got a bunch of money, he wanted to buy a building downtown, uh, Chicago, I believe it was, and turned out they was ready to do the business on the phone when they saw who it was. They said, oh, that building's not, you know, available. And he had to get attorneys to represent purchases just because they wouldn't sell to a black man, even if he have the money or not. Mm. And, and that's one of many great books, Succeeding Against the Eyes by John H. Johnson. It's a great book. Okay. There's many great books, too, you know, that our people are a part of. You know, and, there, and then to mention books, there's a lot of books out on the issue of reparations. That's why I, uh, like I said, I was in the Dallas chapter and I had, didn't know what, you know, reparation was. So I went on a reading campaign and started right. reading everything that I could find <laughs> on the issue of reparations. And I got so good at it. Uh, Brother M. Hotep, a the guy. Oh, yeah. The attorney he asked, he actually left Dallas at uh, uh, around uh, two years later, after about '97. When he uh, went to Mississippi, I think. He went to Mississippi to work with that guy I just told you about, Chuck Wade Lamoon, but okay, okay, that's law what's firm. Up. Yeah, oh, he that's came. What's up. He came here and recruited him. And so when that happened, everybody was looking around for who's going to take his place. Right. Okay. He <laughs> went with you. That's they voted on me. They voted on me to that's be the next co-chair. And they actually put their dollars together and sent me to my first conference for in Cobra, which was in Chicago. And I think that was 96, mm -hmm. 96. And that's where I fell in love with in Cobra because I saw right. how serious it was. And, uh, and I, and I, you know, just learned so much at that conference. And I came back and uh, kept recruiting people here in the Dallas chapter and uh, again, that's how I got to meet people like John Wiley, and and because it wasn't very, uh, what's his name uh, was over the, uh, uh, what's his name, in NAACP in Dallas, wasn't it? Oh, you talking about the tall brother of Grand Prairie? Yeah, uh, yeah, I can't think his name right now. You wouldn't yeah. ask, but yeah, yeah, I know you talking. Yeah, I got the tall to meet him. With the cover all all the time, right? The Afro light. Yeah, he allowed me to speak at the NAACP meeting and stuff like that because some of our members in our group was in, also in the Dallas NAACP. But and so I kept just learning and moving up, moving up, moving around, and right, going right. places, doing radio talk shows and things of that nature. Is that when John Wiley still had his radio show? Yes, he did. It. Okay, I did. I did his show. Uh, maybe twice. I know I did it once, but maybe twice. Because there wasn't very many people in this area uh, aware of the reparations movement. Right, right. I, and I was so, so they everybody called on me. Cheryl Smith, you ever heard of her? Oh, absolutely. I know Cheryl Smith. Yeah, yeah she used to be on the picket line with us. Yeah, I've done As Cheryl Smith. Fact, I think I came to one of y'all news conferences, but it seemed like it was about in Cobra, but the Nation of Islam head, headlined it. Because the brother that was the minister at the time, and I can't believe I can't think of his name right now, but that brother, it was a news conference. I forget where it was, Sunny South Dallas, somewhere though. Oh, okay. okay. I was invited. You might have been there, but the Nation of Islam invited me though. Nation of Islam? Yeah. yeah oh. It was a co uh, news conference within Cobra and the Nation. That's what it was. They did a deal together. You don't remember an event like that? I, I remember though. being a part of a, a press conference, and but mm -hmm. it was it was the it wasn't a nation. It was a brother was, named Thomas Muhammad. Oh yeah, I know Thomas Muhammad. Yeah, Thomas was, Muhammad was not in the Dallas. nation. He was more of an orthodox orthodox Muslim. He was not. Oh, Christian. absolutely. No, he went with the nation now. But I remember a news conference that, and I can't believe I can't think of the brother's name. <laughs> You're probably me. talking about Minister Jeffrey Muhammad. That's what I'm talking about. I can't believe I couldn't think of Minister Jeffrey Muhammad. Yeah. But yes, I was at one of those that he pretty much, I know, invited me, but it was about in Cobra, though. I do remember that distinctively. And he oh, yeah, we worked a lot together. Him. We worked a lot together. Uh, Jeffrey Muhammad. Is okay, here. yeah, yeah. And yeah. I came to one of those, the one that he was a part of. Yeah, he's yeah. still one of my go-to persons. If I need something, especially anything that has to do with the nation, you know, right, I call him. He's not over the mosque. He's over. He was over the mosque. Yeah, at the time. Yeah, yeah. He was the minister. There. He's still another, a ten. He's still a ten. Another brother named Rashid. Something I can't remember the brother yeah. name. But he's I still a ten. And, and, and Jeffrey Muhammad, like I said, back in those days, there were not a lot of people knew about reparations. So he allowed me to even speak in Mosque Forty Eight. Okay, and, yeah. and and I know one while they were involved of uh, getting food to people over there in Dixon Circle. 
uh, those apartments over there. Uh, and uh, we were involved with that, helping them because they was using that rec center, Larry Johnson rec center uh, for the preparation of food, stuff like that, maybe distributing. Yeah, the Nation of Islam was doing quite a bit in Dallas one while around those times. Like even when Commissioner was in jail at Loose Derrick, you know, the Nation's president was always strong. And then, you know, that's somewhere uh, around the era of the Million Man March. So you know there was a lot of physical and, and exposure going on when uh, they were promoting the Million Man March. Because Brother Minister came and spoke in Dallas too. And, you know, yeah, we well, trip together for that too. It was that okay. leads me to say I, I'm, I'm still somewhat uh, associated with the Nation of Islam. They, they had a, a group, or there is a group, in Dallas called the uh, Local Organizing Committee. The Local Organizing Committee was created to recruit brothers to go to the Million Man March. And they had these, okay. in, they had these in almost every city. Their job was to you right, know, right, right, right. Yeah. to go to the, and they call themselves the Local Organizing Committee. You know Michael Bell in uh, Fort Worth. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the preacher dude, reverend yeah. or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. He's over the Fort Worth Local Organizing Committee. Okay. They had, they had them in every city. I hadn't and, seen anything on them lately, but one while they were quite strong and physical going on. Yeah, and that's what I was saying. Some of these local organizing committees stayed together after the Million Man March. Right. So we have one here in Dallas called the Dallas Local Organizing Committee, and I'm associated with them. And they're linked to the Nation of Islam? They, yeah, they are, but they're, they're not limited to the Nation of Islam. Right. You don't have, you don't have to be, yeah. But they created it. They created this movement. Yeah, the Nation of Islam created it. Mm -hmm. Anybody can be a member of the local organization. Absolutely. I just want to give credit where it's due on the uh, 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 yeah. originality of a thing. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm still I'm pro black, all the way across. You know what I'm saying? Our likeness is way more important than our differences. So, yes. what's your religious, this, that, other? That's not a, a minus or plus. That's your choice. That's what that right. is. Right. Yeah, as long as you love black people, that's it. That's the criteria mm -hmm. I believe in. If you love mm -hmm. black people, that's enough. <laughs> that's what local organized committee is. They mainly uh, uh, work on uh, helping the youth. They have a youth festival. Is there a way week. to access that group? Any way to access it? Yeah, that group. I mean, to know about it. I didn't even know about it. So is there a way for somebody to reach out that may want to collaborate or something with them? Yeah, I know the, uh, the the president, a sister named Wana Ali. She is in the nation, uh, and she I do I believe they do have a website. So look okay, great, yeah, Dallas, yeah, local, like get Dallas LOC, Dallas LOC. And they, they meet monthly. Um, they meet have they have meetings monthly, and I've missed a couple of last. Where do they meet? You, you know what I mean. Right now, they, they were meeting at the Martin at the Martin Luther King Center, but when okay. when COVID hit, everybody started having their meetings on the phone. Right, right. So they do they do phone conferences now. Okay, well, yeah, I can get with you on some information. I'd like to see what they're talking about and get involved with them too. Please do, man. They would be glad. They'd be glad to have you and talk to you and tell you what they do. Cause I yeah, yeah. The that. goal is to help. Well, she's mostly underprivileged children. You know, we take up money and collections and. And school supplies and take them to the school and give them to the children and stuff. That's what's that. Oh, yeah. yeah. They in South Dallas, you say? They were meeting in, in, in Martin Luther King Center. Okay. But, you know, the, the members are from all over Dallas. Okay. And they may still meet over there at the. Well, they're meeting, they're meeting by phone conferences now. Oh, they, they're still on that. Okay. Yeah. Even though, okay, things are loosening but up. They, had, they have an annual. Uh, 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 Family. Annual day where they, you know, they uh, like a talent show for children and they give them awards and money. And, oh, stuff. That's what's up. and they just had one, uh, not when was that? I've been thinking about September, that I think it was about September of last year, and they had it at Paul Quinn. That's what's up. Because I've been thinking lately, all the activity we want to do with you because we want to get a building. I'm like, talent shows used to go on all the time. You hardly ever hear about talent shows. We need yeah. to bring talent show. Let them youngsters do what they do, and like you say, give them some prizes, all that good thing. Oh, and yeah. I keep seeing on the internet, I hear people like on Facebook say we need to start back on family reunions and this, that, and other, and not only meet for funerals, stuff like that. They yeah. hear a lot of that. I hear a lot of that, and I hear a lot of this too. Uh, like I have a, a cousin, daughter, son, 
And I saw him on Facebook. He asked to be a friend. I did. And he kept doing the thing. And I would compliment. I said, call me this, that, and other. And then eventually he said, hey, man, what you need? And I'm like, I'm good. I don't need nothing. And what I'm getting at, I even seen a dude from Detroit, actually. He's the first person I heard say something about foundational Black Americans. I thought he crazy, but it come from the Tyreek dude. But anyway, I heard that brother say something to the effect of people only contact me when they need something. And I hear that in Dallas a lot, <laughs> even daughters. And it seemed like this an epidemic of people that don't contact people just in general only when they want or need something. Mm. And what mm. I'm surprised at is that generally speaking, what I'm hearing, they don't play with it like every now and then call without asking just to make it look like they only call like it don't like that's not it but it's like they only even try to play with it. they only call when they want something <laughs> they only call in between to try to make it look like it ain't suspect so it's amazing the cultures that's going on right now in there most of them are uh self-destructive yeah when you said uh foundational african um... I said foundational Black Americans. Foundational yeah, Black yeah. Americans. When you said that, I, I thought about this other uh, reparations group. There's many reparations groups out there. With one that just came up a few years ago called ADOS. Now, if you say many, how many would you guess that to be? You say there's many uh, reparation organizations. 20, 30? Well, just guessing. No, it's not that many, I don't think. Okay. Maybe However, there, there's many organizations, quite a few, hundreds, that actually support the concept of reparation. Okay. They're, they're not or anybody or black people particularly. No, there's other people than other than black people. Actually, there's a there's a, a petition of three hundred different organizations calling on the US government to 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 pay uh to pass this bill for reparation have you ever heard of human rights watch it's no. an internet it's an international group and they put together a petition and they had over 300 organizations and they're all they're not all black organizations are they signed, are, are they affiliated petition. with amnesty international it sounds like the same thing but it's called human watch oh and, but they might even change the name over the years you're thinking no, no oh, okay, I, think, okay. I think, but it's a, it's an international group, though. Okay. It's not a local I know group. Amnesty International; they're a group that, like you say, don't care what colors, just try to right wrongs. I think yeah. they had got involved that dude Tukey Williams over in California, but it didn't help. But you know, they had even got involved in that. And I read about a lot of good stuff when I was young, and that makes a big difference. I think, are you pure yeah. and get that great information about humanitarianism? That's probably part of the reason why I'm a humanitarian. Because I've yeah. seen those type of people early in age, early in my mm. life. I've always seen adults try to help children. I've always seen that. And that's probably why that's in me. Probably. Well, let me let, let me let me get this straight with you then. When you say foundational black Americans, you are you speaking of those people who are, are descendants of Africans who were enslaved in America? That's specifically what that is. Yes. Okay. That's well, that's the name of that group I was telling you about, ADOS, Africa, uh, descendants of Africans who were enslaved in America. And they, their, their, their concept of reparation would only go to those people who Absolutely. prove that they're descendants. And COBRA is not formed like that. And COBRA says all Africans. But uh, I, I think that will be switched around. The people that, okay, they can prove don't deserve it, don't get it. If the burden of proof should be on us. It should be on them. You hear me? That's what I believe. If I'm wrong or right, the burden of proof shouldn't be on us to prove that we are that. We yeah. here. We've been here. Okay, come on. What you talking about? Social security numbers should be enough. As long as now, once you know, like Obama and Kamala, you know both of them, neither of their parents were black in America, period. Obama's uh, mother was white Caucasian in America father uh kenyan i think out of africa so he is not a foundational black american because nobody descended from that in his parental life same way with kamala mother from india father from jamaica she is not a foundational black american and yeah, i know that's not accidental either <laughs> I know yeah, I that's wrong. that's true but that's not I, we don't think that that's a uh uh, put should be the gauge of who who's entitled to reparations because again reparations is not well, just about but you saying you saying deserve but what about when you said meet the criteria of being a descendant of enslaved african that's 
It's steady, isn't it? That part. It's steady. No, I don't think that that's that's fair to say all your other Africans in America who who faced racism and Jim Crow, which was came after slavery, were not are not entitled to some type of uh, uh, reparations. Again, not just cash. Reparations right. is not. So just let me ask you money. this: Does that mean reparations is not just for those that were impacted by uh, chattel slavery? Because that's what that sounds like. No, 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 no. Jim Crow was just as strong and, and bad on African people. You know, what happened after chattel slavery was just as strong and, and just Okay, as so as you're as saying as reparations is not just for enslavement. It's for even those other uh, horrific times. For the, even for the things that we're going through today. Okay, yes. Yes. okay. Yes, so therefore... So in, okay, is that only for blacks then? Is that huh? only for blacks? We're yes. focusing on only blacks? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's that's even in the name of our organization, National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. We don't even have any white members in our organization. You know. So yes, in reparation, we're we're fighting for reparation for Africans in America, black people in America, uh, who have you know, who, like you say, who who was uh, who was injured, you know, by the by the uh, uh, slave trade and slavery, you know, and Jim Crow. And uh, you know, brutalized, murdered, raped, tortured, you know, and and their families. So yeah, we look at it as all black people who have faced racism. And then again, if we just say re reparations is for black people, then you can all uh, uh, no for descendants of those who were enslaved. Then it seems as if you're talking mostly about a cash payment, because if you're talking about. Uh, what we call it, we have thing one, one thing we call the five injury areas. Mm -hmm. Those things that that started doing slavery to still affects us today. And those things has to be addressed. Mm -hmm. and, and one of them is the wealth gap. If you look uh, at what what the average wealth of a black family and a white family, white family have 10, 100 times more wealth than a black family. And they should for the advantages they had. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Because of things like redlining, when they wouldn't allow black people to get loans or, or mortgages. And, mm -hmm. and for years and hundreds of years, we had uh, unequal pay. And, and for, it's still going on. All that you know, just mentioned still happening. <laughs> and, 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 and most of the time we've been here, we've had double the unemployment rate. You know, if unemployment rate was four percent for whites, it was ten percent. What about incarceration rate? How about that? <laughs> that's another. That's another one of the areas that we have to look at, and that we call that the criminal punishment and, and the unjust sentencing, like you said. Like you right, know, right. you know, we got to correct all these things. Uh, uh, criminal punishment, like colleague Muhammad call it, the criminal criminal justice system. It, it's criminal <laughs> itself. <laughs> Absolutely, come on, yeah, they, they got documentation of it. <clears throat> yeah, and you know how the, uh, the 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 war on drugs was was created just to lock us up, lock, lock many of us up for yeah yeah. The, the, the sentence for a crack cocaine was twice as much for powder cocaine. Way more than twice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know we, we know that that was we was targeted. I mean, they even planted the drug uh, anyway in, in the community yeah, of our people. Did. Come on now, so they are yeah. guilty of so many things. Like you right. said, reparations for so many things and. Yeah, so crazy. reparations is right. about correcting all of these wrongs. And then there's the health care. You, mm. you know, the health care system has, you know, they, they've done so much to us, even experimented on us. You've heard it. Yeah, we're targeted in every aspect yeah. of the society. Health care system. We don't have health insurance. The majority of our people don't have health insurance. We don't have good medical attention. We don't even have what well, one or two hospitals in 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 south of dallas you know you know we don't have the, the health facilities uh so those are some of the things to help care and we had one thing that came out of in cobra we called the harm report mm. the harm report was done it was a study done at john hopkins university and it was it was started because we noticed that we were catching COVID twice at the twice the rate of white people Mm. And we was everybody was trying to figure out why was this happening, and so we 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 commissioned a study out of John Hopkins, and they came back and said we're suffering from, they call it epigenetic trauma. Mm. 
epigenetic means it's in your genes. So the harm that they did to us is actually in our genes. When you live 300 years every day of your life in terror, it actually changes your DNA. <laughs> Mm. And it makes you it makes you more susceptible to diseases and, and certain certain kind of diseases, and so this study that we got is called the Harm Report, and mm. it is it's scientifically based to say that they actually altered our genes by having us living in a life of terror for over three hundred years. So we have to look at that under the help help you know uh, uh, part of reparations, co that correcting really what they've done to us. And that gives us more reason to be, you know, to be getting reparation because you've harmed us. You've harmed by actual DNA. And then we talk about education. Mm -hmm. And you know, from 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 the time we was here, they refused to give us an education. Period. It, it was against the law to even teach a black man how to write, read, or write. Absolutely, that yeah. was real. You, a, a white person, could be jailed and fined if they even got caught. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to trying to teach you how to write. And as you know that that did not end after slavery. It, it, you know, we fought to get in. We had segregated schools all the way up until when? Still now today. Yeah, oh, yeah. Like, if you ever check out a deal called 50 Years Later, about that uh, thing went on Central in Arkansas. I've seen that. It segregated internally. Internally. But guess what's interesting? They segregated them based on grades. And oh, grades. what that show you, the yes. blacks ain't learning. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That's yeah. deep, ain't it? Yes. Segregated right inside the building. Yes. After they had to, had to fight deep. to get inside the building. That's deep. And then that's they're still deep. fighting segregation inside. And that's, that's happening deep, man. not that just in, in Central High School. That's I'm sure. No, but I'm just saying that's one big prominent thing that people know about historically. What happened? That's the uh, that one little Ruby was it? But it was somewhere where they didn't want to let blacks in. But because of that, but then like I say, it's integrated. <clears throat> Yeah, that room mentally, is but the way they got it set up, it's still segregated internally in the classrooms, right there inside the same schools that they talk about segregation. So they and got it built they, they also those same people are segregated outside the school. Their neighborhood is by, yeah by your finances. Yeah, absolutely. Your finances. Yeah, yes. So yeah, it's most neighborhoods, to, black neighborhoods, yeah. rough neighborhoods in most cases, sadly. Yes. Yeah, we have to. We, they have to. We have. That's all a part of reparations to us. We're not just saying, "Give me some money," and, and it's all over with. No, we're gonna have to look at all these areas where they hurt us. And then the last one that we look at is what we were talking about earlier, and that's our peoplehood and our nationhood. Mm -hmm. We were not even considered human beings, so they actually took away our right, uh, our humanity. And and we we still lost about. You're talking about before we were given the three fifths. They said zero at first, and then they come up with three fifths. Is that what that <laughs> is? I'm asking out of curiosity. No, even though they had three fifths in the Constitution, they still did not. As long as we were enslaved Africans, we were not considered even a human being. Mm. That, that three fifth was put in there for their representation. You know, their, their of us not being what we actually are because i know like what you're saying uh sadly uh you could uh, one of those caucasian that own a slave they could kill a black person with no repercussion like you say maybe a fine or something like that but you steal a horse they'll kill a white man for stealing the horse but you yeah. kill a black person and no since uh repercussions like killing a horse nothing like yeah. that yeah so that they actually live and still do sometimes considered us less than human and and they had black codes in those days where black people couldn't do this, you couldn't do that. I was mm -hmm. telling somebody about back in those days, they had what they think called a laughing barrel. Mm. You ever heard of that? No. Laughing barrels, they would put these big giant barrels on the street. And a black man uh, who wanted to laugh out loud, he had to put his head in that barrel because they didn't like they didn't like seeing black folks laughing out loud mm. on the street. So you know that that's Great. yeah taking away our humanity. That they said no, y'all you you don't. I don't even want to see you laughing. Put your head in that barrel. That's you know, cold bloody boy. That is ridiculous. But I know they had a lot of horrific things that they did. But I never heard of that for yeah, a minute. Look, look when it you were up, talking man. about the barrel, it made me think of a thing I did hear about a barrel, and it was at these things they call picnics. And I ain't talking about the hanging part. I'm talking about it was a barrel. They would do something like 
have, uh, I guess, stakes or nails through that barrel, put a black person in there and roll that barrel with them inside of that barrel with those spikes mm. as mm. it rolls. Yeah, yeah, they've done a lot of horrific things to our people. For sure. speaking, yeah, speaking of the lynching and stuff like that, how they, you know, and, they and tying them. a pregnant black woman to a tree and ripping the baby out of her stomach in front of those just to put fear in them. They've done many of those things. I mean, I've read a lot of books, so I know a lot about what has happened right. in those right. areas. So, so we had Jim Crow laws and, you know, so all of that has to be looked at when we're talking about reparations. That makes a lot of sense, too. Yeah, we talked about the restitution and the compensation and, and mm -hmm. the cessation or stop, you know, in uh, put put together programs and, and policies. Is that asked for apology, too? An apology is also necessary. Yes, it okay. is. Mm -hmm. That's a part of what we call satisfaction. You should do a, an apology. Uh, you should put forth resources that yeah, will resources. help change the, the, the curriculum in school and stuff like that to teach people about our condition. And, you know, it's like, you know, it, it even uh, create African centered schools. You know, that's that's something that, that we're so one know. thing about that part. I think we're going to have to do that <laughs> to <laughs> educate our people properly. We're going to have to do that. We have no reason to believe anybody else would. And then why would we expect them to? I don't and, even want. And that goes crazy. with that goes with everything about reparations. We're the, we're going to be have the ones who determine what reparations is, and how how it should work. We, we're not going. We're not asking for uh, the government to give us anything. You know, right? Right. To, you, just want to make, to you owe us reparations. Absolutely. You owe right, us right. resources so that we can repair ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's the way yeah. we look at it. We got to do the repair work. Right, right. There's right. gonna be plenty of work on our part. You know? It's got it's all our part, really. You know, it's all well, our except part. for the resources we want them to provide. Right. <laughs> I mean, even though, like you say it too, in that respect, because it's like our tax dollars in essence, right? Right. <laughs> that should be that some people say that should be a part of re reparation that right. we be exempted from taxes. Because yeah, you know we're gonna get that good though. <laughs> because we're paying we're paying for our own reparations if we have to pay taxes. Right, but you know it ain't gonna get that good. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't gonna get that good. Sounds good, but no. It's more than one way to skin a cat. You see what I'm saying? So right. well, we can leave that part because that ain't gonna happen. But yeah, we 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 have definitely, like you say, the things that have happened to us are deserving of some type of compensation. <laughs> yes. No doubt whatsoever. Definitely. Definitely. And so this reparations movement, when when I told you when we were talking earlier about uh other groups in the past that you know that fought for reparations. Right, right, right. This yeah, is this is know. what we call the modern day reparation movement. But as I learned about the re reparation movement, it actually started uh, in the early thirteen colonies in the Revolutionary Era period. It was a sister by the name of Belinda. What was her name? Belinda Sutton. Who filed a, a lawsuit in the in the city of uh, state of Massachusetts and won reparations from from her uh, so called enslavers estate after he died? I think they were set okay. free, and she filed for reparation. That was back in seventeen eighty three. So we, we've been fighting for reparations all the time. I could go through year after year, and then of course you know about eighteen sixty five when. Uh, General Sherman passed special field order number 15 to allocate 400,000 acres and for us to divide up in 40 acres. And he was going to give us the, a mule to go with it. So that's what a term 40 acres and a mule. If you, Anytime I ask somebody, do they know what reparations is? And they say, no. I say, have you ever heard of 40 acres and a mule? And they say, yeah. We all know that that promise was made. Really <clears throat> Now, check this out, though. One thing I know about in that situation that went through Congress, 40 acres and a mule had passed through Congress, but then it was vetoed by Andrew Johnson. So it that went was through actually, the process. No, that was actually something different. It was... Uh, okay, a different deal from that, because I'm saying Thaddeus Stevens, someone else out of Pennsylvania, did that. that Charles Summers and Thaddeus Stevens, yeah. Okay, they the yeah. one who passed the bill allocating land. But, the 40 you know, acres interview, but that president that came after Lincoln was assassinated, he vetoed it. Andrew but Johnson. So therefore, they didn't go through the process to override the veto. Because you right. can override a veto, but it takes more for that to happen. Right. And they usually right. don't do that. 
Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the, another thing that a lot of people don't know about this 40 acres in the mule, uh, when General Sherman actually allocated the what land. What state was he from? I don't know. I know he was a northern okay. uh, northern general. Okay, okay. Yeah, he, he fought on the side of the Union. Okay. But he, he broke the back of, 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 of the South, he, you know, with the help well, of the I asked that because, you know, Juneteenth came to realization because a brother was down in Galveston, right? That's deep right. in Texas. And then right. that's how they come to know when he saw they were still doing slave work two years after enslavement had ended. Supposedly. Two and a half years. Yes. Yeah, supposedly. Yeah, the Emancipation Proclamation was passed in 1863. And it was up until 1865 or afterwards that uh, that you know the Juneteenth thing took place. Right. But one of the things I was going to point that I was going to make about the 40 acres and the mule mm -hmm. that, that was you know given by General Sherman. He and the Secretary of War met with 20 so many black men to see what it is that they wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, when, you know what did they know what about freedom and what did they want when they when they were free. And they said a land of our own. Mm -hmm. And that's when General Sherman and uh, the sec Secretary of War, I can't think of his name right now, allocated the land over 400,000 acres, I believe it was from South Carolina, somewhere down into uh, Florida on, on the West Coast there of Savannah in that area. Did they, they receive it? That's what I was, that point I was going to make. They actually gave them the land. Okay. And, uh, and black people moved into the land. And not only they were just given the land, they were given uh the right to rule themselves. Okay, that's yeah. what that's that's one of oh, the that's things. crucial. Yeah. That's crucial. You're not you're no longer a citizen of the United you know, you're not you know doomed by the laws of this country. You make your own laws, just like sometimes they, they allow for the, 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 the indigenous people on the pockets here and there, you know. So yeah. I mean, because like even when Lincoln did the Emancipation Proclamation, he said, "But I ain't talking about Mississippi or Louisiana." No, no, yeah, no, he he counted them out. He no, I take that out. back. He he was only talking about the South. He was not talking about the North. Who are you talking about now, Lincoln? Or Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln. Yeah, okay. He, he, okay. when he wrote the Emancipation Proclamation, mm -hmm. it was to free the all the enslaved Africans in the Confederate states, not the border states and not the northern states. Okay. That freedom came later. So what was Mississippi and Louisiana? What were they categorized? They were Confederate states. states. Texas was a Confederate state. Yeah, but he said he's talking about not freeing them too. I mean, when you read the book, I think it's the book by Lerone Bennett Jr., uh, Force in the Glory, maybe something like that, because Abraham Lincoln was a straight racist. You know, most People in America, I don't know about what white folks know, but every black person thinks Lincoln was a good guy, but he was not. No, no, he was not. He was a racist. I, He's I, straight I, out I, racist. Yeah, no, but the average black don't even know it, though. They think he actually wanted to free the slave because it was wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, he'll, he, you, you read his papers, he'll tell you, you know, he only did that to try to save the union. He yeah, right. But the average know. black person think that this was one of the best presidents because he freed the slaves. Yeah, but he was, he, he for some reason, he was looked upon as someone that that would that would do that. That's why he was assassinated, because you know, a, a couple of months or something after he had uh, he had did the Emancipation Proclamation, he was uh, he was assassinated. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and and then the, again, the point I was making that the, the black people moved into the land, right, right. And uh, when Andrew Johnson took over as president, he actually told the black people they had to move out and a lot of them refused to so he said okay the land that, that that general guy had gave him yeah general Sherman. General Sherman. Okay. so right, they right. had to send the military in to make the black, black people leave the land okay you know, and give it back to the, the southern planters and stuff like that but yeah. yeah we actually did get that territory and uh but weren't able to keep it just like mm -hmm. uh you know the book we talk about a lot of time black massacres look at what they've done you know this is Black Wall Street is in here, and they've done various things, various places. We're talking about 27 well documented. So we got 27 well documented. How many are not documented at all? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and I'm, yeah. I'm highly familiar with uh, the Greenwood District. You know, you call it Black Wall Street. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've, okay, been, there. I've been there many a times. I, I know the attorney uh, who's filing the lawsuit 
uh, for the survivors there. Uh, and he has an organization called Justice for Greenwood. And okay. you can go, yeah, you can go to his website and see all of the work that he's doing and he's done. And that's actually the second lawsuit, I think, has been filed. Well, there's so much going on. I've heard some talk about they're trying to make it where only those that survive then can get anything. It's about three of them, from what I understand, hundreds of them. And so they're trying to fight to make it where some of the descendants of those that live can get something too. So it's fights inside of fights from what I've heard on that situation. You know, they're trying to screw over those people even now <laughs> after hmm. all that. Yeah, but that's not what the lawsuit is all about. The lawsuit is about the whole district of Greenwood, and then there's many uh, defendants. Uh, dis, what you call them? Defendants in that lawsuit. That's not of those three, three survivors. There's three survivors there, and they're ranging from the age of 103 to 108. Yeah, they're pretty old. And, I, and I've met them. I was at the last lawsuit, our last yeah. trial that they had to. to I hope you. I hope you took a picture with them. <laughs> I took pictures of them, but I didn't take it. I wish you would have took one with them, man. That would have been great. Yeah. Yeah, they were all in wheelchairs. I could have. I should have. It would have been great, man. I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't thinking like that. Right, right. Just, you know, just glad the, the courtroom was full. I know? can imagine, man. That is such a historical thing. It just had, it was 100 years anniversary, about a year ago, I think, of that situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah a couple of years ago, they had the 100-year anniversary. Mm -hmm. That took mm -hmm. place in in 1921, so 2021 would have been 100, 100 years. Mm -hmm. So a couple mm -hmm. of years ago, they had that, and I missed that too. But I missed that for some reason. But you mean my, like being in Oklahoma? On, on 2021, I didn't go to the hundred. Oh, you wanted to be there? Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I think it was Biden who spoke there. I'm not sure. I didn't. I just recently found out about it last year, actually. As yeah. far as the, the duration of the celebration and yeah. all that stuff. Yeah, but I, like I said, I've been going to uh, Tulsa for many years. I, I used to go on a regular basis. And uh, and I, I know all about the first lawsuit when there was about 10 or 12 survivors. And, and so, and we, so many of them passed since then. Yeah, we watched all of them pass away. I saw the fight that uh, our, our attorney choked. Uh, Charles Ogletree. Mm -hmm. You you've heard of him? Actually, not to, Charles not to my, now, That name kind of ring. Are you talking about that? No, maybe not. The white guy that had big wild hair. No, not that guy. no. Charles Ogletree was the lead attorney uh, after. Uh, uh, ooh, sometimes I get ahead of myself. What is the famous the famous attorney that we all talk about all the time? He died. Uh, Johnny Cochran? Johnny Cochran was the uh, lead attorney for that lawsuit. And okay. when he died, Charles Ogletree took over as the lead attorney. And one of Vin Cobra's uh, uh, legal strategies uh, commission attorney named Ajo Ayatora, she was a part. It was a group of them. And the brother that's leading the lawsuit now, mm -hmm. he was also a part of that group. That was a group of attorneys representing that first lawsuit. Okay, and, and this brother who's uh, who's over that lawsuit now, he was just he was actually just a student at the time, and I met him through that. It, it's something sometimes you learn not to look over students. I I had spoken at at the at the at the center there, and when you get through speaking, a lot of times people just come up and start talking to you one oh, yeah. one yeah. and asking you questions. So I was talking to somebody else, and he asked me a question. I said, "I'll get back with you." You know, I, I'm talking to this person right now. Mm -hmm. And he got tired of walk, waiting, and he walked off, you know. And later on, I find out he was uh, he was the, the chairman of the Black Black Law Student Association. He <laughs> he was moving up the line. Then he right, once right. he graduated from uh, University of Oklahoma, he turned around and was a professor there at the University of Oklahoma. That's what's and he and I never lost touch with each other because he actually called me to to his classroom to speak on reparations. And I drove to Oklahoma City to his classroom, and that's when he had put together a, 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 a I don't know, I almost said a PowerPoint presentation, but it was actually a video on on the Tulsa massacre, how it happened, what it looked like, mm. and he wanted to show. He showed his students, and then he allowed me to tell them why we were demanding reparations. So I still All know those that. five points you did. You did that in the class, the five point part. 
Yeah, yeah, all of that. Yeah, all of that. yeah. That was a great I, presentation. I've, I've actually had the opportunity to speak to uh, in a few colleges. I have a friend that's here that's a professor at uh, UTA. Mm-hmm. She teaches African American studies, and when I first met her, she was working. She was at uh, University of North Texas, mm-hmm. and she allowed me to speak. Uh, at a at a program that they had, I think it was the NAACP chapter there. She allowed me to speak there. Then she left there and went to Paul Quinn, mm. and she allowed me to go to Paul Quinn. Then she left Paul Quinn. She went to what was community college in Lancaster? I can't think of the name of it. Oh, in Lancaster. I- yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think I know the one you're talking about. I don't remember the name. Though. Okay, she went to, left there, but now she's at the uh, UTA. Okay. And she would do that annually, you know, because she was teaching African American studies. She wanted her class to know about the things that's happening in the community, our black organizations in the Absolutely. community. So she would always give me the whole hour to talk about reparation. Yeah. She would also get a get a. Uh, Nation of Islam, an hour. She might get a Black Panther Party an hour. That's great. She made sure her students knew what organization was fighting for their, their you know, liberation in in their in the community. Oh yeah, so she see that I, it exists too. That's a great thing. That they exist. They even yeah, exist. Absolutely. And so she still, we, she and I are still tight. Uh, she actually has two jobs now. She's she's a professor and she works at the uh, African American Museum in the Fair Park. Okay, I was wondering what that the one. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. You, you go check her out sometime. I think they're getting ready to have something over there pretty soon. They yeah. have things pretty often. I've been to a couple of great events over there. Yeah, yeah. But she's she's also a member of the Dallas chapter in Cobra. She's an in Cobra member. You know, okay. So, so that you know, I've been like I said, I I, I, I came to Dallas chapter. Uh, uh, co-chair we, we work in co-chairs we always have a male and female leadership in our organization it's okay. all the way up to the top is you know you don't have enough a chairman you have co-chairs male and one female so i like I, that i like I was, that i was the co-chair of the dallas chapter and i did that for about five years and i'm going to annual conferences each year and just so happened the regional representative position came open and I ran and, and won that regional representative. And as a regional representative, my my duties is to ch- try to organize uh, chapters in f- seven states. Wow. Seven states from oh, Tennessee. Okay. From okay. That's a nice chunk. <laughs> yeah. But I only have I only have right now two other chapters that I, I, I you know oversee and that's one in Baton Rouge and one in New Orleans. But we've had one in, in in Memphis. We've had one in Houston. Uh, we're very associated. We tried to get some in uh, Tulsa, but you know, we just they were like they were like an organizational member. Because in Cobra has individual members and organizational members. You, your organization can join in the Cobra. That's okay. kind of, we're not just an organization. We're a coalition. That's why we call ourselves the National Coalition. The coalition meaning we have organizations that's members and they have so many votes in 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 the in national business meeting uh okay. just like an individual would so sometimes i assign people up as in uh, organizational members sometimes i uh cre- help create chapters and a chapter has to be at least five people and you can be as many as you can recruit but at least five people okay. we're trying to work we have one at prairie view a and m uh, we're, we're, we're trying, we've had one in Houston. We're trying to get another one in Houston. Mm-hmm. We've had one in San Antonio. Some of our chapters just fall apart, you know, but that's what my job as a regional representative is to coordinate these chapters. So I'm still a regional that's representative. Mm-hmm. And in 2008, actually when Obama was president, <coughs> I was elected the national co-chair of Vancouver. Mm. Yeah, and that's that's coordinating the whole body nationwide. Where was the other half? Where was she from? Her city? Actually, uh, the first one I, I actually did two terms as the national co-chair, and we staggered the election. One year's a male, one year's a female. So the first female that I worked with was from Washington D.C. So the elections are annual. 
annual elections and each year we elect one either the male or the female one at a time you know not both okay. at the same time. Right, right, right. so i actually work with three different sisters because i did three two terms as the male co-chair so the first sister was in dc the second sister was in atlanta from atlanta and the third sister was from louisiana okay and the third sister is the one i was talking to today who's in ghana right now oh okay yeah so I, she lived there she just visited she lived there she okay. lives there she she's not a she says she haven't gotten her citizenship though but she don't want to she come back here for, only for special occasions she she said she didn't gave up on this country man. <laughs> she love it over there you love it man she ain't coming. She ain't coming back. Well, I ain't leaving because I love to fight. So probably gonna always have to fight. So I, I love to fight. She's still. She's actually still on our board. She's still. Okay. You know, so she, you know, because you can attend with Zoom meetings. Right. She's still on our board in the Economic Development Commission. That's mm. the thing about in Cobra, we're ran by or governed by a national board, and uh, and we have nine different commissions who's on the board we have the male and female co-chair we have the secretary the treasurer and nine different commissioners and about five different uh regional representatives but we have a regional representative for the east the southeast southwest which i am then we have one for the west and the midwest we have about five different so that's what our board is consisted of and uh, like i said in 2008 through 2011 I was the uh, national co-chair in COBRA overseeing the whole thing. And that was the year that Obama was president at the same time, believe it or not. <laughs> yes. So you can see how mad I was at him, man. Yeah, because, I mean, what he did, but I, it's an unfortunate thing, but what I appreciate, I appreciate when a person show you who they are. It might hurt mm -hmm. or feel like it feel, but I, I want the truth. So, yeah, the brother showed his true colors and I mean, I don't hold brothers. It is what it is, and then move on. That's what I do. You know. What I mean? Yeah, that was what a that was, was, So we we'll see who is, is what we need them to be. We'll go from there. But I know we got to do a lot of work on our own people. We got to school our own people, and I like to target the children because you get the children educated properly, then mm -hmm. they'll have a much better life. And that's what I like to do: try to help children make their own life better. Yeah, what, what, what I was thinking when you were talking, and I so appreciate this opportunity to talk, have this conversation, because, again, I used to do a lot of talking and teaching about reparations. People all, need to know, too. I know. All, all over the place. I'm telling you, radio talk shows, I've done talk shows in D.C., I've done talk shows in Atlanta. I'm you done, need to get you know, back on it, I think. That, that's what I was going to say, man. And yeah. I, you made me think, because oh, when oh, we were talking about Obama, there was a sister... That's what I'm, I'm mad at myself for, you know, uh, not remembering her name, but she was running for president at the same time. Felina? Oh, no, that was way back. A uh, no. sister named Felina, but that was way back. Yeah, uh, way maybe back. way back when Jesse Jackson was doing loose something, maybe. Yeah, this sister was out of Atlanta, and I, you know, met her and talked. I can't think of her name. And right she now. ran the same time as Obama? Right. And, o and Obama, she was Obama out of Atlanta? Atlanta. Yeah, and Obama, yeah. she was she she was actually a a, a congresswoman, Congress, okay. a U.S. congresswoman. Yeah, so she was already in Congress, but she ran for president also. And uh, Obama beat her in what they call the primaries. Right, so, you know, right. When they when they decide who's going to represent the Democratic Party. In Absolutely. The mm -hmm. But all up until the primaries, everybody was saying we need to get this sister in there, you know, because they hated her. She was like. Like like uh Diane Ragsdale or some shit. She was Jackson or something. That name ring a bell. She was Jackson. Sheila Jackson Lee is in Houston. She's a That's Houston. Yeah, because I know yes. there's a couple of she's uh, in Congress now. And okay. what's significant about Sheila Jackson Lee, uh this bill I told you about HR forty that we fought for resolutions for. Right. Well, that bill was introduced to Congress by uh Congressman John Conyers out of Detroit in nineteen eighty nine. We've they've been we've been trying to get Congress to pass. Was Ron Dellums involved in that too? Who? Ron Dellums. I think he was out of Detroit. White hair brother, light skin dude. I thought Never. he had something to do with that reparation thing. Ron Dellums was his Never name. heard of him. Never heard he of him. He was out of Detroit too in Congress. So that bill was introduced in 1989 by John Conyers. Mm -hmm. And John Conyers had to reintroduce it every time the Congress in, you know, midterm. 
all the bills that's on the table go away. You have to reintroduce them. Oh, that's kind of yeah. That's just the way they work, man. They gotta mm -hmm. start all over again. Mm -hmm. You know, so that bill he kept introducing that bill because he kept winning out of Detroit. He kept being the con. He was the he was the senior congressman when he when he actually uh, resigned. Right. And but he kept this bill going since 1989. And then Cobra was in business at the time and helped him write that bill. In fact, it was one of the in Cobra members that spurred him to do that. Right. So uh, the bill is, is is still going on right now. But when he resigned, Sheila Jackson Lee took over and she's introducing it every year. Hmm. And last year, with the help of Encobra and other organizations, we got the largest number of co-sponsors. See, it's in it's in committee, but if you can get co-sponsors, then the committee would be uh, called upon to bring it out of committee and take it to the floor to be discussed by the full Congress. And uh, they actually did that about a year or so ago. And, and it never still got to the floor. Mm. And, and I, I think, think if I'm correct, the reason why is that the Speaker of the House decide what's get, what's, what bills are discussed. And <clears throat> even Nancy Pelosi says she was for it. She never brought it out. She never you know, mm. put it on the docket to be discussed. Yeah. So the bill get lost again. Now we have to start all over. It had over 200 co-sponsors. Now we back down to about 50. And that's one of the things we do. We lobby our congressperson. We have all our members. We have anybody we talk to to call your congressperson and tell them to be a co-sponsor of HR 40. And they know what to do. They know how to get their name on the on the bill. And the more co-sponsors you have, that that shows you that if you had like 250 co-sponsors, it gets to the floor, then it's gonna pass. Cause all these people are saying, yeah, we for this bill. So you have to. We have to lobby. I've got, I've lobbied in the U.S. Congress. I've lobbied in in the state of Texas. I used to go to the state of Texas and, and and go to Capitol in Austin, and talk to you know representatives about you know passing resolutions in support of HR 40, just like we did with the city of Dallas. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done that in the, in the Dallas County. John Wiley Price had passed. He's passed two two bills in the county. <clears throat> in some mm -hmm. sort of reparation. And the last one was so comical, it was pitiful. Because they 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 was gonna vote on commemorating Juneteenth. And that was just John Wiley was gonna pre present the county uh, a, a resolution to, to commemorate Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. And he did not put it, he did not give them copies ahead of time. You know, because most time they distribute their stuff ahead of time. You know what's going to be talked about. Right, right. So he didn't do that, but he went when he when the day came for him to read the the, the, the bill. He read it out loud, and they over there talking wasn't paying no attention to what he said. And mm -hmm. he said that the Dallas County supports reparations for African Americans. They didn't even hear him. And then they said, "Okay, let's take a vote." And they all voted yes. Mm -hmm. And all the newspaper men said, "What? What y'all did y'all do? Y'all know y'all just voted for reparations for African Americans." Oh, they were pissed, man. <laughs> and they didn't take it back. They wanted to take it back, but they, it right. made them look bad to even vote for something that they wasn't for. For especially the Republicans, you know. Yeah, yeah. They, they kept it. John Wiley got that done twice in the county, and even the city of Fort Worth has passed a resolution in support of our HR forty. I wasn't a part of that, but I was, you know, associated with people who were. So that's one of the things we do. We go around cities and states getting getting uh, bills passed and resolutions passed. And uh, and it, it's, things are moving so fast nowadays. There's mm -hmm. a city in Evanston, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. And one of their city council ladies actually passed a first, the first citywide resolution, I mean, reparations bill. They put aside, I think, four hundred thousand dollars to be given to black people in that city. Mm. I didn't like it because it had, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, it was a, a monumental <clears throat> thing. It had never happened before, uh, but right. it had stipulations that what the money could be used for, mm -hmm. and to be used for, you know, uh, repairing your house or buying a house because the city had discriminated so much in the housing market 
So they decided right, to right. give black people some money to buy a house or fix up their house. And as you know, the state of California just passed a, 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 a bill for reparation for the yeah, African, everybody. yeah, descendants of <laughs> descendants of those who were enslaved in Af in, in America. And right, right. We, like I said, we we in Cobra, some of our members spoke up against at at, at their uh, uh, sessions. They had quarterly sessions listening to the public what we thought and we always you know commend commanded commended them for you know for doing so but not for just descendants of uh, in, uh africans who were enslaved so that's a big thing too that's happening and the whole world is watching that to see if california can do it and a lot of other cities have done it. as if they do do it that's for sure yeah and a lot of other cities have done it. one in north carolina had done it uh but then you're mentioning cities but this is a state that's doing the state it. of california, california so that's yeah. a lot state bigger than california. that little city yeah another thing that that california had had done was there was a sister who was also in a cobra in 2002 her name was deidra pelman she filed the class action lawsuit against uh corporations and railroads <clears throat> for reparations and her lawsuit did not go anywhere. And it was because the judge said she could not actually prove that her relatives were damaged by these corporations. She won part of the lawsuit, but she didn't win the reparations. And mm -hmm. she, I, we brought her here to Dallas in, in the protest because one, one of the corporations was Chase Bank that she was filing against. And, uh, from from that from that all of that work uh we 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 all decided that we're going to find out who what corporations actually harmed us you know that that was that was the thing and not just those that she filed a lawsuit against and so a lot of our chapters and uh went to their cities to file for uh what we call disclosure ordinance and a lot of cities did it dc chicago philadelphia uh, a lot of other cities filed these uh disclosure ordinance and that and what a disclosure ordinance was to say that the city would not allow you to do business with them you couldn't get a contract with the city until you can show what contacts you have with slavery because chase manhattan bank had been you know shown to have owned slaves you know, it's other cities that have shown, um, you know, big corporations have been shown mm -hmm. to, even universities like Brown University, mm -hmm. they had over 200 slaves that they sold, out, you know, in, in to, to keep the school alive. And they, they wind up uh, admitting to their wrongs. But these slavery disclosure ordinance were, were tools to say, if you want to do business with the city, you have to, you have to do research to prove if and when you had anything to do with slavery. And so California was the the state that did it. Most of them that did it was cities. Right, right. Philadelphia, D.C. Uh, I can't think of all of them. It probably eight or nine. Of them. Right, but California, but California, California state. did it. Yeah, the California did it in a way that you couldn't even do business with the state of California until you done the research to show that whether you own slaves or and it's all on the california uh, state of california website all the information that they gather what company owns slaves and how many and and mm -hmm. all that so they they did a slavery disclosure ordinance for the whole state of california so mm -hmm. it is more progressive i think than, than than a lot of other states but but you know reparation was paid in in the in, on the, in the tuskegee experiment those. I didn't know that. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, that that was when uh 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 when Clinton, did they get it? When, when Clinton, well, I know he apologized. That's all I knew. No, I ain't heard about no reparations. Yeah, they were, yeah, oh, they so were, was that the reparations? Just an apology? No, they were compensated. Okay, okay. Well, those are did I think some of their descendants was compensated. I didn't hear nothing about no compensation. I just heard no bill apologized for it. That's yeah. it. I heard nothing about nobody getting nothing. Oh yeah, they got that. They will come. I'm glad somebody got somebody. This is my first time hearing that somebody actually got some. I thought you were talking about the ones that did get some that wasn't us, like the Japanese and a few other folks, something like right. that. But now that's great. But I didn't know those brothers actually got compensation. This is my first time hearing that. I'm oh yeah, though. yeah. Even and then you've heard of Rosewood, Florida. 
Yeah, I know that they got some. I they heard of that. Some. Yeah, they got some kind of something over there. And right. that was the only two uh, black masters that I knew about was Black Wall Street and Rosewood. I didn't know nothing about the other one. Was the first one was in New York City. It was something about a protest of the draft. And they was upset with blacks, and it was a black massacre. Then the second one was in uh, New Orleans, I believe. And then the third one was in Memphis, or oh, vice versa. I know Memphis, New Orleans, and New York was the first three. Yeah, so they've been doing this in Harshley forever, ever yeah. since we've been here, man. Yeah, this movement is picking up steam. It's constantly. That's great. Moving. That's great. That's, that's a great thing. That's, that's, you know, and that's, like I said, that because of the in Cobra started out by, you know, being almost the sole organization pushing yeah. for reparation. Yeah. But it's, yeah. it's happening so fast and so many different groups coming up and people. Y'all didn't quit either. Y'all didn't no, give up. No. 36 years. Man. No, y'all didn't give up or quit. None of that. No, That's good. Not going to not gonna give up. Got to be ready for the long haul, man. This is life's work. And that's that's one of the things that John, like I said, about John Conyers did. John Conyers was uh, instrumental in getting Martin Luther King holiday passed in the Congress, and they say it took him thirteen years to do that. Yeah, it so, took several things. You know, various people were involved on that effort. I call it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, but he had to introduce the bill. Yeah, you know, yeah. As far as the political yeah. side that can actually make it happen, no doubt he's the main key for that. Yeah, but you yeah. know, it takes the masses a lot of time too. Just like. Free Huey P. New. If the people are not there in them streets, they've never freed them. You know what I'm saying? The people can impact the situation. Yes. They get involved. That's true. And that's another reparation demand, the 10 point program by the, uh, the Black Panther Party. You know, mm -hmm. the Nation of Islam have their uh, a demand for reparations. It's on, on, the, on the back of their newspaper where mm -hmm. they're demanding land and uh, compensation. Uh, you know, until until they're able to take care of themselves. So the Nation of Islam demands reparations. There's so many other entities, like I said, that, that uh, demands reparations that you have to really look at it. But uh, again, it's picking up steam. The Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. The, the, part of their platform is reparation. They came okay. out against criminal punishment, the fact that police was killing us in the street. That's what they were formed for. But they understood that that was just a part of the repair process, you know, okay. dealing with the criminal punishment system. So they have a reparation demand. You can go to their website and read their reparation demand. And then COBRA helped them to, you know, formulate that. You know, mm -hmm. know that most of the experience will come from in COBRA, not all of it. Right, right, right. And yeah. you have you have you have a uh, we have an organization called CARICOM, which is a, a organization of the Caribbean islands. They came together and formulated their own organization group from representatives from the Caribbean uh, islands, including Jamaica. Jamaica is always uh, you know filed for reparation, but the rest of the islands they all came together and uh, and formulated the. Uh, Caricom, they call themselves the Caribbean Island something. I don't forget what it what it stands for. Yeah, yeah. They're filing lawsuit uh, and filing against uh, uh, England against the British. You know, because they the one who enslaved them in in um, South America and the islands, the Caribbean. Right, right. So they're filing, and uh, you got yeah. I mean, black people all over the world are filing for reparations. You know. You know. Yeah. In Canada and Australia, you name it. You know, we we all understand. That, that. sounds like black people then, waking up. What it sounds like? Guys, it's always been a fight for reparations, and but you know, and more and more the the United Nations is getting in on it. The United Nations is going through something right now. They call it the the decade. They call it it's on the tip of my tongue. In the other words, they're gonna use a whole decade to look at the situation of African people worldwide. Mm. And it's from I think 20, from 2014 to 2024. It's almost over. They're going around from every country doing reports to see what condition black people are in, and then they should formulate a report after that to see what these nations need to do. They came here and they, they visit. They visited several cities. They visited, I think it was Jackson. Mm. And I'm not sure if it was DC or somewhere, but they came back with a report. And they, they talked about, and they report, and you can find all this stuff online, 
you can find that they did the report about uh police brutality how that is and they, they and they and they report one of the things that shocked me they said because of racism there is at least a plain load of africans dying every day just by simple being in a racist country mm-hmm. you're losing that many black people every day of the year because of sick strictly nothing but racism so yeah they are, they're looking at the whole world and, and, and black people's condition worldwide they 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 had a uh, they had a conference in durban south no durban south africa called the a con- the world conference against racism mm. the world conference against racism where all the nations of the world come together and uh examine how racism is affecting anybody in their country it wasn't just black people there's anybody any kind of racism it was very controversial uh conference because the united states actually boycotted it mm. yeah they because they didn't want to they, they didn't want to discuss the issue of reparations and they didn't want to discuss the is the issue of israel was, you know they were looking at what israel was doing with the palestinians right right and so they didn't and then they had colin powell was the secretary of state at the time mm. supposed to go to that conference mm-hmm. they did not go because of those two reasons not him but the president you know yeah it was the boycott thing you're talking about yeah yeah they boycotted the world conference it's called you know and that happened in 2001 but that conference did look at the issue of reparation for african and americans and they decided, yes, I, what happened to us is a crime against humanity. And all crimes against humanity, the, the only solution for a crime against humanity is reparation. They didn't come out and say that we're entitled to reparation, but they did give what happened to us, our enslavement, the status of a crime against, recognized by the whole world, that it's crime against humanity and that the United States has an obligation to make it right. They right. should have just used the word reparation, but they didn't. So we take it as a win that they, you know, did the world, the world recognized that our enslavement, uh, it was a crime against humanity. Right. And they just didn't use that one word, but it said the same thing. Right. They said the same thing. So mm-hmm. that part there tells us, you know, that, you know, the whole world knows what happened to us. And it's definitely a, a subject that's being looked at thoroughly. Yeah. yeah. Well, so they, they have looked these, at it, yeah. Yeah, this uh, the, the World Conference Against Racism, they have them, I think, like every five or 10 years, you know, to look at the issue of, of racism worldwide and see mm-hmm. what people are being, uh, you know, subject to, to racism. Absolutely. So, you know, like I say, man, I, I have to study and, and be ready, ready to discuss this subject at any time. And, and you know, it, the good thing I, about, I like about this, when I got into it, it uh, introduced me to a lot of heavy hitters, man. Mm-hmm. A lot of heavy people that's been out there fighting this fight for for years, generations, decades. I mean, decades, man. One time, I when I was the co- national co-chair, uh, I was I was called into a group of scholars to write a paper. Not just me. We were going to collectively write this paper mm-hmm. against. Henry Louis Gates. Okay. Because Henry Louis Gates had put an ad, I think it was in the New York Times, trying to put the blame for our enslavement on Africans. So mm-hmm. yeah, they sold y'all into slavery. You should be, you should be asking for reparation for them. Mm-hmm. And all of the scholars in America said, no, no, our 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 reparations comes from the United States government. That's who sanctioned our enslavement. You can't put it on those African nations. And mm-hmm. so these scholars came together and said that we're going to write an uh, op-ed on what Henry Louis Gates had put into that that newspaper. And so I was called to work work with them. And I looked at the list of all the people on there. <laughs> Everybody was a professor, doctor, attorney, 
<laughs> All of them had a title, man. But me, right. my, my title was Brother James. <laughs> That's good enough. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I'm saying, my line of Karinga, you heard of him, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I the dude that come out with the uh, quantum it, thing. It was people like that, man. All yeah. of them scholars and professors. And <laughs> You're saying Brother James. Yeah, and Brother James. We all had to sign off on this. I could send it to you one day. We all had yeah, to sign, yeah. off <laughs> sign off on this letter that was sent to the New York Times. To be That's published. what's up. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, like so I, I got to meet some very heavy hitters, man. Yeah, so you did. <laughs> I still know some. I still know some. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my love. Black people that love black people. That's my yeah. thing. And that's why I fell in love with Encobra because they were all, I mean, I can call on just about I, anybody I want right now and say, I need this. I'm coming to town. I need a place to stay. You come here. You know, you, yeah, you, you, you know, oh, yeah. I mean, in Cal California and like Philly, DC. Atlanta, mm -hmm. Miami, Detroit, you name it, man. Yeah, I, you know, yeah. South and all that. And uh, so I, I was, you know, fortunate enough to get to know all these people. Man. Absolutely. Um, and and like-minded people at that. Like-minded oh, people. That's a blessing, man. Yeah. And to work with them and to be, you know, be accepted, you know. Oh, um, you're a part of the group. So I'm a part only, of the family. I'm a part. Yeah, I, it's only yeah. five. <laughs> yeah, I almost dropped out though. I did, in fact, I did drop out for a little while because I had a if I ever told you, but I had a, a family emergency that took yeah. me from all movements and activity. But I came back and mm -hmm. still back, and, and I'm still on the national board. Actually, holding two positions on the national board. That's I'm, what's I'm, I'm not only the regional representative. I'm on, I'm the uh, membership commission, and that's one of my jobs is to you know sign up new members. Get their memberships approved. Uh, sign, uh, get the uh, whenever a chapter is you know wants to be a chapter, they have to send the paperwork, and I have to look over the paperwork, right, right. issue them their, their chapter or chapter certificate, and, and so. But I'm not, you know, I'm not doing it alone now. It's a whole community. right, right. <clears throat> yeah, that's good though. You working on a, a major project is definitely worthwhile for our people because it's about our people, and it's gonna come to fruition at one point. And that's why I, that's why I joined at, at the Million Man March when Minister Farrakhan told us to go back and and, and join some organization that's for yeah, the benefit yeah. of black people. Absolutely. And, and I looked around and I was like, what can I do? Mm -hmm. I had a I had a friend of mine who lives here in Dallas. He he's made his transition. He started a right surpasses program for boys. That's he great. said, I want to help these young men become young boys become men. And he, he recruited about four or five of us to help him do that. Mm. You know, and I, I worked with him at first. And I, I, I tried that. I couldn't do it. I, I mean, some of them boys, I want to take out my belt and whoop them. Man. He's not, you can't whoop the boys, man. You got to teach them. You can't be you know? so, yeah, well, But I, yeah. Cobra was something that I saw that was not just for different, any one segment of our population. It was for everybody. Mm -hmm. All black people are in, you know, to to gain something from the reparations movement, and so I so that's something I can do. I can, you know, I can do that. You know. Oh yeah, and then, you know, I want to be for something that's for all black people, not just the elders or the children. I mean, I, we all got to do that. I, I take people. You do whatever your talent is. That's what you should be, you should, you know, be doing. If you have a talent, use it for children. If you're just a good pastor, you know what I mean. Do that, you know. Mm -hmm. you're a pastor, that's that's what you do to help us as you know, as a people. You know, do that. You know, so do something. Yeah, whatever it is, like you say, with the good intention of helping your people. But I like to talk about helping your people help themselves. Yes. See? So yeah. a lot of times, people need to know more than they know, and then they can help themselves better. Yes. See? So that's what it's about. That's Self sufficiency. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. That's a good. And so you made me think about something else that I used to do at the post office. I used to take a survey to see how many people, uh, our people, you know, African people, were involved in some organization for the betterment of our people. Right, right. That sounds like something you would do. <laughs> <laughs> I was so sad to see that very few of us actually get involved, man. You know. Yes, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate to a degree, but people are who they are. You know, a lot of people through this paper chase, I guess you could say, they're caught up in 
enjoyment, fun, and relaxation. Yes. Some people don't want no kind of conflict whatsoever. Don't want to fight for anything. They don't have to, and they did that already, and they just want to enjoy their fruits. And that's okay, because nothing's for everybody. But I want to fight, and we got a lot of fighting to do. Got a lot of fighting to do, man. You can't, you, really, you can't do it by yourself. You really need to be no, organized. You, but the great thing is, it doesn't take all of us to make life better for all of us. No, it that's the great part. That's that's true. That's the great part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And once we get it going and rolling and stuff like that, okay, there's a big portion, like you say, people not doing anything. Some of them for different reasons. Some don't see something. Some hadn't heard nothing, but when we get going, when we want to get going, a lot of those people are bandwagon people. Once mm -hmm. they get rolling, they coming. We talking about significant things that help you, and we talking about free too. Oh, brother, they coming. Come on, man. <laughs> you yeah. know that. Yeah. Things that you want and need, and it's free. There's no reason not to come. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So that's that's what I'm on. I'm on them children, man. That's my thing. I love our people for sure, but the babies are. In my heart forever, always having. I loved children when I was a child. Wow. <laughs> I was seventh yeah. grade. I was seventh grade in the classroom, social studies. And I said, I want to help children. So I was either 11 or 12, because I'm always two different ages in this grade because my birthday in February. So I was 11 or 12, and I knew I wanted to help children then. And I was a child. So you, you definitely, you're definitely a leader, man. You definitely, I noticed a lot of people look up to you, bro. A lot of people look up. Well, that's great to know. And I know one fellow, brother, on 315 acres. Man, if you want to go with us, we go on March the 11th. I'll talk to you if you want to go. Because this isn't the field trip part. This is just a visit to see what we can do with this place. The brother lives. You probably know him, Greg Ellis. Uh, he worked at the post office. He's a custodian. Well, you might remember. But you can look at my one episode. It's a uh, operate in your gift. But anyway, yeah, we're going to go there. And the thing about it, man, this brother want our people to see what it takes to be able to provide your own food and the vegetable part and the animal part. I mean, you can imagine 315 acres, he got some animals over there, so the mm -hmm. eggs, I mean, he's selling the eggs and stuff. Man, it's so interesting. Man. Our people are so much of everything, we just got to come together. Yeah. And once we do that, and we at the threshold of doing it, too. We at the threshold. Where is this land at? Uh, it's in... Uh, Navarro County, it's just an hour and a half away. It ain't far. That's what's great. And to be able to travel that short of time to see such a significant thing in life, that's great for us right here in Dallas. It started out, I was thinking about a brother out when I saw, I went to Philly last July. He's talking about they took some youngsters, never been out of Philly to Maryland. I'm like, maybe we can get them to Texas. Long story short, that fell out. I'm like, well, let me do this right here in Dallas with our babies right here. Because I've always said, to me, Dallas is a country town with a city twist to me coming from philadelphia <laughs> i didn't even know that philly was such a concrete jungle that it is because when i went to chicago from i was shocked to me i would have thought chicago is a, a southern city because all the grass and trees but <laughs> philly you've been there so you see it looked like a maze you know what i'm saying i bet you if you fly over in a helicopter it looked like a maze all those buildings for blocks at a time right the row houses yes Man, I don't think there's another city like that on that scale. I know Baltimore have some, but not on that scale. You're talking Philly was the fourth largest city in the country. It's the fifth now. Houston knocked it out. Now, New York got a lot of congestion, too. But most of these places aren't as concrete and tar and street like as Philadelphia. What well, I've seen, and I was so shocked. And Philly, it's a different jungle. <laughs> yeah, I've been to Philly several times, and all I can see is y'all can have it. Because <laughs> even Detroit, even they have space in between, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. they've been through a lot. But from what I finally realized, there's no urban jungle, concrete, tar street like, like Philadelphia. What's Definitely not on that scale. What's the name of that uh, university there, the black university? Temp oh, black. Temple? Uh, no, Temple. I know you're saying black. Temple show ain't black. Uh, I'm it's not. Not sure. nah, Temple University. <laughs> Come on now, no nah, boy, that's them folks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now Bill Cosby went there on that, but now uh, I didn't know one of them was ours. You mean owned by us? No. Well, you you've heard of Malif Malik Malif Asante? No, I don't sound familiar. Okay, I think he's a, a professor of African American studies at Temple. 
Oh, well, but Temple ain't owned by blacks, not at okay. all. Okay. So we've had a conference there because they have several universities in Philly. So I thought you're talking maybe Drexel or something else, but no, Val, I, I think there's a couple others, but no, no. I know Temple ain't black owned. <laughs> hey, no, I, I guess not. But if we did have our conference in Cobra Conference there at one time. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they got a lot of black stuff going on, but yeah. I don't think on that level. Look, we actually, mm -hmm. I actually stayed in the dorm. You know, they, you know, because you know, school was out that time. I think it was okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, I was born in Temple Hospital, <laughs> so oh, what? Okay. Right up there on Broad Street. I probably was born to the uh, world by intern, more than likely. <laughs> yeah, and I've, I've been, I've been to Howard University. And okay, yeah, and yeah. That, We've had conferences that we used to have them at all, like major major uh, universities and colleges oh, yeah. and cities. Yeah, so yeah. I'm glad you came back and you back for good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they won't let me go, man, because I mean, they don't invested all this time and money in me, man. I can't just drop out. Well, and then actually, not only that, you're competent too. If you were incompetent, they wouldn't worry about the money. <laughs> I'm actually right a here. life member of Vincobra. I have a lifetime membership. That's what's up. Uh, so you I deserve know. it too. Yeah, so deserve some it. people have to buy a membership annually. I don't. I I paid one big price for life, man. I got yeah, and you doing the work, man, and that's what we need. We need those to share the knowledge, wisdom, and everything that we have that we know is good. We need to share that. Yeah, I just did a presentation uh, Saturday, a bad news chapter. You know, again, I, I failed to mention that's why I'm here today, because our organization have what we call the Reparations Awareness Day, where okay. we all tried to do something on the same day or around the same period of time to educate the masses about reparations. Right. So our bad news chapter did a, a, a Zoom, Zoom meeting, and uh, I was a presenter there, you know. And I had to talk about the organization and the and the concept of peoplehood, nationhood. That's what they what, what the the, uh, the whole program was about the Montgomery bus boycott. We had a professor from Southern University to speak about the Montgomery bus bus boy boycott. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I learned a whole lot from him. He's another brother that I, I'm I'm highly associated with because he was at Prairie View, and mm -hmm. he and I was trying to get a chapter there together at Prairie View. He left Prairie View and went to Houston. What college is that down in Houston? Uh, Prairie View. Oh, no, he's talking about Rice, I think. No, it's a black college. You know? Oh, I don't know. Well, Southern, Southern. Isn't it Southern? I guess it's something. I think it's not Southern. I think it's it's not not something Southern, but I don't know. He's at Southern University in Baton Rouge now. Okay. okay. So he didn't left Prairie View, then he went to Houston. Now he's in Baton Rouge, and he's a professor of uh, 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 history and uh, mm. African-American studies. And uh, right. yeah, we He actually get... do a pod, pod, podcast, too, or he was last time I talked, he was going to start one. Something like that. So yeah, yeah. I, I like that uh Koofy Glasses color coordination. I like that. What's that? Koofy and glasses color coordination oh. that. <laughs> but the blue can and you, black. The can you actually black. see them? Yeah, I can see the blue strip. I can see the blue and the koofy. Yeah, that's oh. what I said. I like that color coordination and the koofy is on point by itself. But oh. you can put the color coordination in there with the glass. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's another thing about me. Uh, after I changed my consciousness back in 90 something, I changed my whole outlook on life. You know, and I started wearing African clothes. I don't even have a suit and tie. I don't wear suits and ties. I don't even I have I just recently got a tie. I hadn't earned a tie. I owned a tie in years. I call them a, a European noose, but just for a tie, <laughs> I got it couple of suits and a couple of ties. First time yeah. in decades that I owned a tie. <laughs> only when I'm when I'm getting when I'm dressing up for something that's only I have so many different African clothes, so many dashikis, <laughs> so many African suits. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, I, I had one African garb outfit. I don't know what happened to it. It was black and brown. It was nice too. I really liked it. I don't know what happened to it. Over the years I lost it or something. Yeah, I, I went to Lubbock and visit my sister-in-law and I had on a plain black shirt, just a plain, not a shirt, but it's like a like a t-shirt, a black t-shirt, long sleeve. Right. She'd say, 
I ain't never seen you without no African clothes on. She's been knowing, she been knowing me for so many years. I've never seen you like this. Before. Yeah, with nothing African on. But yeah, sometimes I, sometimes lately, sometimes lately, especially when I know I'm not going anywhere, I will wear. But I try not to wear anything European or anything with some European writing on it or anything like that. I hear you on that, homie. I have well, a, I mean, a that's a t-shirt, uh, black power t-shirt. Oh, absolutely. Just knock t-shirts, whatever you know. I got 50, 60, 70, 50 or 60 t-shirts, man. I man. I try to get as much black owned product as I can, like this cat. It's a brother. Uh he was on uh what's that Facebook? His name is uh Monty Jones, something like that. I don't know what he does. He might rap something like that. But anyway, I was talking about how I wear that well off uh, attire by Dion uh, Sanders Jr. Yeah. And he said something about this flat line. I said, okay, well, what's the concept? He said, well, anything that's hindering black people progress, we need to flat line it. I said, well, <laughs> I like that. And so he gave me the number to contact, and it turned out it's his brother, clothing line. And what's interesting, uh, when I met his brother, who was less than a week ago, I met him to get the product over in North Dallas. This brother, he looked really young. And I met him, and he said something about getting out of prison. And I was like, how long? I was talking about how long was it that he been out of prison. He thought I was talking about how long he did. He <laughs> said 18 years. And I was shocked because, to me, he looked so young. Yeah. Okay, then we talked one time or two on the phone, and I talked about telling his story, something like that. So I found out he's 38. So that means he must have went in at 20 and get out at 38. And November is not that long ago, you know, to be wow. undid 18 years. So I'm going to see what it's talking. I don't know his story, but I like the product. I got the cap, and I got a matching jacket because I like to buy stuff. And this shirt, I got it at a Pan-African Connection had a Malcolm X Festival. At uh, what's that church with Freddie Haynes? Yeah, Friendship yeah, West. Yeah, I was right. there. I was yeah, there. And it was a lot of good stuff. This the shirt, I loved it too. And you can tell the black oh, owned okay. and all that good stuff. Yeah. So I yeah, there. I you do. You ever heard of the newspaper African African News and Issues or something like this? A real colorful newspaper that used to be circulated around Dallas. I don't recall it. I don't I, recall I, it. If it was African American News and Issues or something like that. Well, anyway, the owner of that newspaper is a, is a black guy. He's a, a millionaire, lives in Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. And I met him on several occasions. And one time I heard him say this. He said, I only wear clothes made by African people. No, that's right. And that's what got me to saying, well, that makes sense, man. All of my African clothes are made by African people. And he said, the reason I do that, he said, I'm rich. I can wear anything I want to wear. He said, but I, I know that if we wore clothes made by African people, for African people, if all of us did that, he said, we can employ all of our people overnight. Because all of the stuff we, most of us wear, come from Korea, come from China. He said, That's because we're buying it from the outlet stores. Yeah, you know, yeah. We're going to have to get a connect with ourselves and make it happen. We can do it, no doubt. Yes, if we wore clothes, African people wore clothes made by African people, he said we could create a whole new industry that would employ all of our people overnight. And we spend our money with us. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's one of the reasons I continue to wear African clothes. Work yeah, African we waking people. up, we waking up. Yeah, and, and that's what I'm loving so much. I'm, I'm loving the journey. I know I, I interviewed a lady, Dr. Uh, Candace, uh, Lucas, yeah, she's got a PhD in education, and she is so much looking forward to the day for us to celebrate us getting there. And I'm so much enjoying the journey. I'm loving <laughs> the journey part, man. I am. That day is going to be jubilant and fun, but man, I love the journey so much. I'm loving. Yeah, it, it is a journey. journey. I've been on a journey myself with Encobra, and you know, like I said earlier, we our mission is to win reparations. And if we get to that point and win reparation, we don't need in Cobra anymore. It's over, you know. So I'm, we're on the we're on the journey. <laughs> we're trying to well, get. Well, but I don't have to disband because one thing about it, guess what? Once we get where we need to go, then we got to work at maintaining it. Yeah. So work is never over. No, you're right. Right. So we got to maintain. So we still need 
in Cobra to maintain it after yeah. we obtain it. You heard me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's real talk, my man. Yeah, but I man, really appreciate you too coming on for sure, man. Yeah, and I appreciate you, thing. like I said, in our conversation and uh We'll have to do it again sometime. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just let me know, my man. Absolutely. And, uh, great I will be, day. I will be day. inviting you to some of the programs that we have, you know. So. And I'll come, too, because I yeah. love being around people that love black people. That's I love in that environment. That energy. You know what I'm saying? Every person has energy. It's either negative or positive. Black yeah. people, I see that love black people. All that energy has been positive. I love positive energy. Yeah, we've done. We 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 know quite a few of the same people, so we will. Oh yeah, we do. We do. <laughs> running, running into each other, and uh, again, I appreciate it, man. And this, you know, this gives me some more courage and momentum to get back out there, man. And, and, and yeah, it's just you getting back reattached to your mission because you've never been lacking courage. Ever. No, no. <laughs> No, you're right. That's right. I already know. I, already I was no. I was no. Not only carriage, I would go right. anywhere, man. I, that's I, what that a, man. The thing about it, anywhere. for me, I don't get how can a black person not understand a black person not fearing black people. If you love your people, I ain't no way I'm scared of black people. I can't fear what I love. Even people that's in religion, I'm not in religion, but I know there's a creator of life. They'll say. God fearing. I can't feel what I love. <laughs> I can't do it. I'm not even going to try to do it because I love God. Why would I fear God? If God is love, what's the reason for fear? Right. Unless you caught up in some of the jargon. I'll leave it at that. That's what. That's so all it is, jargon. That's all it is. <laughs> yeah, but thank you again, brother, man. I appreciate I'm looking forward to You know we said something about having lunch. We ain't had the lunch yet, but we did the podcast, so we get the lunch <laughs> happening soon. <laughs> we'll do that. We'll do that, but I look forward to it, brother. Absolutely, brother. Thank you again. Appreciate you. <laughs>